Good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to the 14th Annual Women in Science Alumni Career Panel event. This event is co-sponsored by Women in Science and the AU Career Center. My name is Teresa Larkin, and I'm an Associate Professor of Physics Education and Director of the Dual Degree Combined Plan Engineering Program option that AU offers in affiliation with Columbia University. I also serve as the advisor to our amazing Women in Science student organization. Women in Science has had a banner year this year in large part due to our uh, wonderful and outstanding leadership. I'm so proud of this group of student leaders and it's such an honor for me to serve as their advisor and to serve as one of the moderators of this important annual event. I just have a few tips, uh, tips for those of you in the audience. Uh, I do want to remind you that the event is being uh, recorded and will be made available to those who are not able to attend today's event on the Career Center's YouTube channel. Uh, you can submit uh, your questions via the uh, question and answer feature on Zoom. If you're attending the watch party, Carly, Carly Rockford, our WIS co-vice president, and Leah Wayne, our recruitment chain, uh, chair, will handle securing your questions and posing them to the panelists. We have assembled an outstanding panel of alumni who have all earned a STEM degree at AU. We have invited them to this platform today to provide helpful suggestions and offer advice to you, our current students in the sciences at AU. We hope the dialogue we begin today will serve to provide you with some advice and useful information as you go forward on your own career paths. The alumni that have taken time out of their own schedules to join us today include Sarah Bianiak, Kathy Furlong, Bella Height, and Rebecca Lindenfeld. After my brief opening remarks, I will turn things over to our WIS leadership who will start us off uh, by asking each of our alumni panelists to introduce themselves. Next, I'd like to offer a few thank yous. First, I would like to thank everyone at the Career Center and especially, especially Delia Rabatin uh, and Elizabeth Romick for their help with this event. We couldn't, we couldn't have pulled this off uh, without you, so thank you. We also wanna thank all of the awesome uh, other folks at the Career Center for your continued and tireless efforts to assist our students, including our undergraduate and graduate students, as well as recent graduates, as they navigate from the academic world to the next phase of their professional journeys. One goal of this panel event is to learn about the experiences of our alums as they traverse both the academic as well as their professional STEM careers. It is our hope that these shared experiences will, pro will provide encouragement to our undergraduate and graduate students in STEM. An additional goal of tonight's event is about making important connections. One thing I've learned having spent over 25 years of my career at AU is that our alumni understand the importance of making and keeping professional connections. They stay in touch with faculty members and are always willing to serve uh, and give up their time to help out current students. Uh, and making these kinds of connections, I can't stress strongly enough, is perhaps more important in 2024 than it's ever been. I want to share with you the message that I continue to reiterate to my own students. It's simple and I think it's powerful um, and that is we're stronger together. It is through events such as this one that I'm reminded of the true sense of community that forms the backbone of everything we do to embrace one another and live the message of equity and inclusion as members of the AU community. Before we begin, I wanna outline the format for this events, uh, event. So following these welcome remarks, I'll turn things over uh, to one of, uh, of our co-moderators, -moder and that'll be either uh, Leah uh, or um, uh, Miley, uh, who will ask our alumni to speak for maybe two to three minutes uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, following the introductions, Leah and Miley will um, uh, ask the panelists questions from a prepared uh, list that the Career Center sent out to the panelists involved. 
Um, Leah is our uh, Women in Science events co-chair and Miley is our Women in Science uh, treasurer. We'll set about uh, 30 minutes aside, maybe a little longer, depending on how our um, how long our intros take uh, for the prepared questions. And then we'll move on to questions from all of you in the audience. And I really hope that you'll um, you know, ask those questions uh, because this is that's really kind of a fun part of our uh, panel event. Um, and then at this point, uh, when we do the Q&A, Carly Rockford and uh, Leah Wayne will serve to ask the questions from those of you there uh, in the room and from those of you that are online. So you can certainly just type the questions uh, into the um, Q&A box and uh, we'll, we'll be watching that. Uh, we'll do our very best to try and uh, get through as many questions uh, as we can in the time that remains. I want to thank everyone for being here. And I would like to um, thank all of the panelists for being here and for helping to, to make this a, a successful event tonight. So uh, Leah and Miley, do you want to take over and, and we'll have our panelists introduce themselves? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Miley Dowsett. And I'm Leah Starr. And with that, we will start um, our uh, introductions with our panelists. So um, all of the panelists, would you please introduce yourself and tell us briefly about your current job? I guess I'll start. <laughs> so my name is Rebecca Lindenfeld. I'm originally from Caracas, Venezuela. Um, I studied audio technology. Uh, I did a BS and MA in audio technology and graduated in 2017 and 2019. And I also did a physics minor while doing my BS in audio technology. I currently work as a sound editor uh, at, at Parabolic New York, which is a post-production sound company. I do, yeah, I, I specialize in dialogue editing and ADR editing and supervising for film and television. So you might ask yourself, what is dialogue editing? Because it sounds so weird. Um, it's like making sure like the dialogue from the film or the TV show sounds very smooth, that there are no noises that affect the dialogue and shouldn't be there, that all the words are understood. And ADR consists in the process where the actor needs to come to the studio and re-record lines of dialogue that didn't come out well in the production or other lines that, for example, want to be added by the director, the writer, or the editor. So I need to supervise those sessions, making sure that the quality of the sound is correct and it matches the picture, and and then edit that. So that's a, in a nutshell what, a, what I do. And I currently live in New York. New York. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and education. Then I did my first master's degree in philosophy and religion. And my second master's is statistics. And one of the things about me is my career path was never linear. I My problem is I have so many interests and I like to do so many different things that I bounce around. However, the one thing that I have found is that because I have so many interests, I am a global thinker. And therefore that kind of helps me work with a variety of people and I can connect the technical with the non-technical people. So it, it's a big advantage. At this point, I'm retired, very happily retired. But I keep my hands busy because I mentor through the Washington Statistical Society. I am two, on two committees of the American Statistical Association. That is Statistics Without Borders and the Committee for Scientific Freedom and Human Rights. So I, I keep myself in the field, but definitely involved more so with mentoring. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah. 
I did a bachelor's of science in biology and a bachelor's of arts in physics as a dual degree program at AU. I graduated in 2015. And uh, after that, I worked in a lab for a little while um, and then eventually decided to go back and get my master's in public health, which I did online through GW. And uh, that led into an internship and the more public health focused uh, kind of program management and administrative career and role that I hold now. Um, I currently help run a residency program for nurse practitioners and physician assistants who are in their first year of uh, primary care and helping them transition into practice and meeting like workforce needs in rural healthcare settings. Um, so lots of using my skills in adult education and then also uh, critical thinking skills around uh, challenging situations for people uh, across the lifespan. And I think that's me. Um, hi, I'm Bella Height. I just graduated from AU last May. Um, I was a computer science major, and now I am a software engineer at MyFitnessPal. Well, I'm wearing a sweatshirt, so MyFitnessPal. Um, I am on the platform team, which I did my whole undergrad in ComSci. I learned a lot of front-end, back-end engineering and all these different things, and then I get this job, and it's, like, completely different. So I work with basically... The apps that you see on your phone, I don't touch any of that. I'm working behind the scenes to handle traffic from millions, hundreds of millions of users, because if all those users hit one endpoint, it would probably be really slow or crash. So I basically like help keep the app afloat in that way and containerize the traffic along with making things easier for the developers that are working on the direct framework of the application that you see making their lives easier and giving them tools to assist them in their coding. Thank you guys so much. Um, next, we'd like to ask, um, what was your job search like? And some example questions that you can answer within this are, how did you organize your postgraduate job search? And when did you begin? Um, how and with whom did you network? And just include anything that you feel is relevant. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start again to keep that around. Um, so my job search started in December of 2017 before like five months before graduating from my master's. I start and it started this way. I started researching a lot of post-production studios in LA. So I made a list of all the studios that um interested me. I, I put down the, their email address, uh, supervisors, uh, also phone numbers. And my plan was to go during spring break uh, to LA and meet with as many people as possible. So during starting December to until like uh, March, I started reaching out to all those studios and only a few got back to me. So that's very common. So only like out of, I don't know how many I reached out, only a few. Uh, um, responded back and I was able to meet with like one or two, one or three. I also, um, my research also consisted of, I, I knew some people from my high school in Venezuela who lived in LA and that like worked in the field. So I asked them if they had any connections or somebody that I could, um, could visit. And I, in fact, got a, a day of shadowing in one very prestigious uh, sound post-production studio, which was a great experience. And I also asked my professors if they knew someone who I could meet during that time in LA. So always rely on your professors because they're like awesome. Um, yeah, they're a great, uh, a great resource. And through them, I also met with two more people. So that way, uh, after meeting with uh, those people, I was able to get an internship uh, in June. So I, I moved from D.C. to L.A. in June of 2018, uh, sorry, in May of 2018 and started my internship. Uh, I worked there for three months and it was an unpaid internship. So I also tried to do some side jobs of 
editing uh, like student films. And also I got a, one of the people who worked in the studio saw my portfolio and they liked how I did sound for cartoons. So they told me, oh, if I could help them doing that. But at the same time, I wanted a full-time job. So I, I kept applying to to jobs that kept sending my resume to a lot of people and met people for coffee and and all that stuff and four months later I was one day I was in my internship and I got an email from who used to be my boss at the Walt Disney Company saying that they had gotten my resume to say I have no idea how and that they were looking for an audio mixer to mix the spots for the shows on ABC. So, yeah, so I, I, I always tell this story because that like says like how important it is to like network and share uh, your information with other people because maybe at the time that you share it, it's not gonna, like they're not gonna respond, but maybe a couple of months later, you don't know and, and they reach back to you. So I got like my dream job. <laughs> uh, I, I, like that was I've always wanted to work at Disney. So I did that for a year. But unfortunately, I'm an I was an international student. So um, I had to get a sponsorship in order to be able to stay in the U.S. But I didn't get one, and so I had to do that whole process again. But this time all over the world because I could, unfortunately I couldn't go back to Venezuela because of the situation there. So thankfully I have an EU passport. So I focus mostly on applying to jobs in, in the European, like in Europe. And again, because of reaching out to many people, I got my job in Madrid in the locks is called the company is called. And I worked there for four years. And my goal was to, work as hard as possible and build um my credit list and build a grow professionally in a way that I could go back to the U.S. and that's how I'm back here now I, I currently have a it's what's called an O1B visa also known as an artist visa or a extraordinary ability visa which is debatable but yeah so I I got here in April of last year and the same happened when uh, for getting my job here Again, reaching out to people and not being discouraged of people not getting back to you because that's normal. But the, the more you, it's a, a like probability thing. The more you reach out, the more chances you get of somebody getting back to you. So yeah, that's a little bit of my experience. <laughs> Uh, I can go next. That's so awesome that you like worked really, that you had all those cool experience first off, and then you ended up back in the U.S. like you wanted to. I just think that's really cool. <laughs> Thank circle. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, being I just graduated, also Kendall and Delia, I played field hockey with them, and Kendall was like there. She, for me, when I was applying for, I when I first applied for internships, um, me and Kendall were roommates, which is hilarious, but um. I was, I applied for like, like 40 to 50, like maybe even 60, like internships. I just went through, like, I Googled software engineer and I applied for everything that first off met my standards. So I, I didn't want to go somewhere that had a GPA lower, that expected a GPA lower than mine, because I still like, yes, I want a job, but I still want to have a job that is equal to where I see myself. So I applied to jobs that had like good GPA and like met what, what like abilities I had. But at the same time, I applied to jobs that were above that. So like, don't, I don't, you don't have to go to shoot low, shoot high. So I like when even applied for jobs where it was like, if you don't meet these requirements, you're not going to get it. That's not true. Just apply for it. See what happens. Who cares? Um, computer computer science so I applied for all these jobs I don't know what majors everyone is but you get in computer science and maybe some other jobs you get these exams and they can be up to two hours and I went through all these exams I also got um one of my professors professor Orang helped connect me to someone at Google or like said hey there's a job available internship available at Google like talked to this alumni and it got me past the resume screening thing, which I don't think I would have gotten past on my own. So just a quick side note, really talk to your professors and like advocate for yourself. 
Um, but yeah, I heard back from like, not a lot of, of those, like, like half, half of a hundred, like internships. I did not hear back from a lot. And I only got to like real human calls with like three or four of them, real interviews. Um, and I tried to be so authentically myself because I'm very uncomfortable kind of putting on a mask. And I've told myself going into the industry, like I have a certain standard for where I want to be in a workplace that needs to be healthy for me. So I also kind of followed that energy in my job search. And I eventually got this internship with my fitness pal, um, which I was not qualified for, but I still applied and it turned out my resume and all the things I had done at school was more impressive than everyone else. So really don't sell yourself short and like really like embrace yourself. So I got this internship and I did it through the summer before my senior year. And I did a great job and they were like, great job. Like you were so good. Didn't offer me like say anything about offering me like a full-time job or anything. But I said, I want a full-time job. Like I want to work for you guys. I brought it up and brought it to the table because I don't know if you, you who like you have to ask for things and if they say no they say no so I asked for this job and they said sure if I work part-time throughout the school year and I just really wanted I'm just like that I really wanted to have a solid job so I worked part-time for my throughout my senior year part-time internship and now I work full-time and because I was completely myself throughout the whole internship process and like interview process I'm so comfortable with my coworkers and everything and I feel like I'm in like a really great spot and I love my job now so yeah that was my <laughs> interview process I feel like I mean I also think that a lot of my like work our work experience is also from school I TA'd for intro to computer science my freshman year of college and I TA'd for database classes because professors, because this professor wanted me to, because I was been so vocal in school. And like, I took the time to talk to my professors and like make those connections and show that I want to be in the classroom and learn. So if you, if you haven't done it to like your, the full capacity, I really do just Im recommend immersing in your college experience and it can really help take you and take a lot of stress off when you are applying for jobs. Wow, Bella, you sound like you are so on it. And I have to say, I was not that on it uh, on, in terms of getting a job. Uh, so I, one of the like sub questions in the information that the women in science sent out was like, so if plan A didn't work out, what did you do? Uh, and I think I need to speak to that a little bit. So uh, I was a pre-med student when I was at AU and I ended up not getting into medical school. I graduated with honors and that pathway still did not pan out. So um, be aware that there's like a broad scope of things that can kind of come of a lot of these degrees and a lot of pathways you can go down. Um, I ended up searching for a job basically like right from around the time of graduation. And I found my first job out of college with a science undergraduate degree on LinkedIn. Uh, there was a pharmaceutical lab in the DC area looking for people who had bachelor's degrees to run like lab tech type roles. And so I was a graphitization analyst and I helped run a uh, particle accelerator for uh, not subatomic particles, but particles. And uh, we did a lot of pharmaceutical testing that for some of it led to really cool drug breakthroughs, but my job was very like next step in the process. Um, and then that was the point at which I decided to go back and get my master's degree in public health. Uh, I had kind of realized that I really liked uh, more human interaction in my job path. And so uh, that was what led me into public health and my kind of ongoing passion for healthcare and human um, wellness. And so it was the internship from that program that led me into an administrative role at a nonprofit organization. And uh, 
definitely the self-advocacy is an important thing because I had to talk my boss into giving me the internship. I was like, it's free labor. Don't you want me? Um, and that uh, after a few months of being an intern there, my program was ending and they were like, yes, we've seen how important it is to have you in our organization and offered me the permanent job. I ended up working there for the better part of four years with a few other like side tangents. And uh, then uh, through the pandemic, dealing with like many, many regulation changes, working in healthcare and kind of having that real time stress, uh, kind of led me through a whole bunch of other like consulting gigs and what have you that happened. And eventually uh, I ended up at a different healthcare nonprofit in this more education focused role um, because I too had been a TA in college. Uh, for Professor Larkin, in fact, and uh, really enjoyed having adult learners as part of uh, what I did. And so I think there's a lot of roots. Uh, I now get to work in healthcare training new providers um, when that's what I really like. enjoyed uh, doing and taking care of people. And I get to see the impact of the humans that we like use our science for every single day because, you know, I hear the babies crying down the hallway from my office when they're there for their well child checks and uh, making sure that everybody's life and times are running smoothly for my like residents and the people I work with means that they get to spend that time really like caring for humans. So uh, sometimes life paths are a little bit circular and don't think that the first job you get out of college has to be the job that fits you perfectly 100% like it's going to be the best thing ever um because maybe you have to work and search around a little bit and uh yeah advocate for yourself be a TA if you can or find another like college job that you enjoy um experience always goes a long way and I guarantee you that almost any skill you develop you're going to find a way to apply it in some job or in some fashion in whatever you're doing professionally even if like the only reason that your like mathematical uh, programming skills come in handy from your physics degree is that you're able to help program the Excel sheet for the budget for your nonprofit organization or whatever. Sarah, Rebecca, and Bella, you all have fabulous stories and backgrounds. It's great. Mine is a mixture of all of yours. So I had finished my master's degree. And when you get a degree in statistics, the positive thing is there are jobs out there. The difficulty is there are so many different areas you can go into that you I couldn't figure out where I wanted to go. So I spoke to my advisor at American and she gave me some suggestions. So I decided to do internships. I actually did two different ones. One was through the American Association for the Advancement of Science on-call scientists. I was able to do a statistical analysis for a human rights organization in DC. Loved it. It it was so wonderful just to be able to present the information back to this organization so that it could be used to help them structure and work with people who they were helping around the world. I, I just found it very fulfilling. The next thing I did was there was a nonprofit called StatAid which actually also did human rights work. And I was there learning how to use R to analyze data. So once again, it was learning a different type of coding, looking at a variety of data, seeing what was coming out of this data. And then I actually was on a panel presenting this data at the joint statistical meeting, which is the annual statistical meeting for the American Statistical Association. Having had these experiences, 
I knew I really enjoyed human rights and I knew that statistics needed to be available to a variety of people. Given that, I actually ended up volunteering for a committee of the American Statistical Association, Statistics Without Borders, which is an all volunteer organization that provides pro bono uh, statistical assistance to nonprofits throughout the world. And this, above anything else, this followed my passion because I could look at this organization and I could say, oh, yes, this is worth it. So that's where I wanted to focus my attention. But I still wanted a job because this was volunteer work. I did end up finding a job. It took me about a year. I do have to say, like Bella, I must have sent out 40, 50 applications. Um, but the interesting thing was when I would go into an interview, you would know if this was the right place for you or not. You would just kind of get that feel. And if it wasn't the right place for me, then there was no reason for me to be there. And the, so I ended up working at a for-profit doing sampling of data. And what I really enjoyed was the team that I worked with. Working on a team, networking, that is so important. And I found it extremely beneficial. But when, I, when that job ended, and it ended for a variety of reasons, but when that job ended, my passion was still for all of the volunteer work that I do, which is how I also ended up at the Washington Statistical Society mentoring there. Um, so I fully back exactly what all the other speakers said. Network, know who you are, what your passions are and stand up for yourself. And really, really accept how you feel when you walk into a situation and, you, and an interview and get an idea of whether or not this organization is going to be where you are going to grow as an individual. And always don't go for the, the job that you're qualified for. Go for the job that you go, oh my gosh, this is gonna be so hard because it's going to make you stretch. And just because you had a degree in something doesn't mean you can't expand and everything, you will learn something from every single job you have. Thank you all so much for sharing your experience. Um, it's been so cool to listen to you guys all talk. Um, and it feeds perfectly into the next question, um, which is what would be um, some advice for graduating students based on your job uh, search experience and like time that you spent in your industry? Um, some specific question could be like um, any specific job boards um, or if there are any specific tips of like how to network um, both online and in person in your specific profession. Uh, I yeah, can so, oh, sorry. oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say that um, yeah, DC has a lot of networking things for women. So if you Google like, or go on Eventbrite, like the app Eventbrite and you look up like networking or like women networking events, or you type in your major or like what you wanna do plus, you know, just the keywords looking things up, you'll find an event and they're pretty frequent, more frequent than you might think. And that could be really cool to just, feel out people like see other people that aren't just at AU that that um want to do the same things that you're doing or are also in STEM um and I don't know I just used Google to look for all my jobs I people like say oh you need to look on this website this website just go wherever and look up jobs and then just apply like scroll apply scroll apply a lot of things you just upload your resume and stuff and then it'll autofill so if you have a really good resume that AI can read pretty well, then just click, 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 apply for like an hour a day. Uh, 
So um, in my, for for example, in my field, specifically for sound, for like there are many fields within sound, but the one that I focus is in sound for film and television. The better way to find a job is not through job boards. It's mostly like interacting with people. It can be either by, well, of course, them interacting in person is always better because they get to put up like face to all that information that you send but for example from personal experiences from experience that I've I've learned from coworkers, it's all about uh sending out your information and letting that people like studios or studio managers know that you exist because how it works in my industry is that um, you, it's very rare that you will see, for example, in LinkedIn or in Google, like sound editor needed. Uh, they usually, it goes by word of mouth. For example, uh, we need a sound editor for this movie. Do you know somebody? And if by any chance they had your resume from an email that you send and in, they need you, they're going to go back to to that. And, and that's how it works um, in my industry. And I think an advice that I would say, like, uh, it's always a plan, plan ahead, like research in advance. Like, I'm very, I exaggerate this. Like, I know, like, I started my research like way too long before graduating. But if you can, I would suggest like doing that, like trying to start ahead and do little by little, and start with the things that most interested you, and then also apply to the things that you're interested in, but maybe not that much. And, and yeah, also, yeah, like plan ahead and talk to your professors. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I would oh. go ahead, Sarah. No, you, you go first because I don't have a long answer. <laughs> okay. My background is statistics, and I can tell you DC is the mecca of statisticians for the United States. Because every governmental agency and nonprofits and for-profits have statisticians. And the American Statistical Association and the Washington Statistical Society, if you join them, one, they have job boards, but two, they have networking um, times. And when I have mentored a variety of women, I have just asked them what type of jobs or areas are you interested in. And then you can easily get in contact with these people or get information about them. And I always suggest informational interviews. And I don't, I have not known one statistician that does not make themselves available for informational interviews. The great thing is you kind of get an idea of what they do, how they got there, what their department is about. But in the end, it's all about networking. It's all about just talking to people and getting your resume out there and listening. People love to talk about themselves. <laughs> So I have a little bit of a different professional experience uh, with some of this, although the advice I think is the same uh, in that I live in a much more rural community. Um, so in addition to networking, I'd say like there's a factor of like reputation is important because a lot of people within your field, if it's a smaller field or a smaller area in a bigger field, um, are going to know you and or know your boss or one of your references. And so don't discount those like one-off conversations at a networking event um, where someone might be like, oh yeah, I've heard of them or they told me about this thing they were doing. Um, so networking isn't just like the person who might hire you. It's also the person who might know that person or uh, connect uh, across a whole variety of fields. Um, I also will say I was literally on with our communications uh, director of my organization earlier today, because uh, we're trying to recruit people for the program I run. And she said across the board for the entire organization, the two ways they most commonly find applicants are through Indeed and through word of mouth from friends and family of current employees. So like the way people are finding job postings and the way people are finding the people they want to hire um, 
those are the two ways that she like highlighted. Okay, thank you guys so much. Um, we're gonna ask one more question from the pre-prepared um, pre section um, before moving on to the student-led discussion or student-led questions. Um, so could you please provide a brief overview of the ranges of career possibilities available in your industry? I guess uh, in the industry of sound there, like in the audio field, there are actually a lot of possibilities. You can work for sound for radio, music, either recording, editing, mixing. Um, then there's also acoustics, which also combines a lot of the physics knowledge of, of like the actual physics knowledge of sound. There's sound for podcasts, audio books, um, a, a live sound for concerts for theater then there's also um it's a i didn't even like know about this until like uh, uh recent like the sound that go sound designing toys for kids for example when you go to the disney store and play with a toy and play, push the button that's also like a an application of sound for something so i think the list goes on and on which is which is very good because if you're um when when you study something related to sound, I think there's a broad uh, spectrum of things you can do. I will second that the field of public health is exceptionally broad. And I think, um, you know, we all got a bit of a crash course in public health with the pandemic a few years ago. Um, so all of that spectrum of helping make sure vaccine rollouts happen and that government agencies are setting up regulations and all of that is part of public health and something you can do with a public health degree. Um, there's things more like what I do, which is like clinic administration and managing uh, healthcare providers and people doing direct like patient care. Um, there's also bigger, broader like nonprofit entities um, and global initiatives to help, uh, you know, develop and disseminate uh, healthcare, and then also analyze trends in healthcare and work with our partners who are statisticians uh, to really understand uh, data and concerns. And um, I think there's, yeah, I, I can't think of an industry where you may or may not be able to use a public health degree in the background. It's very broad. Um, I will say I've like been kind of jokingly told by others that like sometimes your public health degree needs like a, a friend uh, if you want to get into a specific field with your public health. So like if you really want to run a big like hospital system, you might also want a business degree with your public health degree to have both sets of skills. Um, so there's a variety of ways and avenues you can take it. Uh, I'll go. Um, well, with software engineering and technology in general, that it's everywhere. It's in every single field, and software engineers can be literally any old job now because it's a lot going on. Especially contractors will get like hired for lots of. I don't know if I cut out, but contractors will get hired for a very variety of reasons. But there's front end which is what you see in a lot of like creating components to like touch or see on a screen. There's backend, there's web, there's iOS and Android, which work on different languages. Um, there's platform, what I do. There's product engineering, which is where you kind of come up with a product concept and you still have like that knowledge in engineering which is something I've been interested in, in too but I've also been told and also come across my fair share of evil men in the industry but I not in my job but I was told by by people that sometimes if a woman like goes into product engineering or certain other jobs they might be but be like kept there and it's hard to get back to like the more the coding side of things so I don't know what it's like in other fields, but I'm trying to be where, obviously I want to do what I want, but I'm trying to be able to not like, I don't know. I want to break the boundaries, but also I don't want to be shoved into a box early on in my career. I don't know. I have to figure that out some more, but um, yeah, there's just a huge 
variety of um, jobs in tech and half of my, not half my team, but like maybe one fourth of my team when I work with like 12, 14 people um, didn't, one of them dropped out, one of them had a completely different degree and they learned coding from like online and that now they're really good at it. So anyone can be a coder and there's so many job opportunities in that, but um, yeah. Like everyone else in statistics, you can do any field you want. I know people who are biologists, conservationists, um, so people who don't work at desks, but then there are also people who work in labs. Me, I worked at a desk and I did survey analysis uh, or sampling, but I, just like I said in the very beginning, people who aren't just individuals who code, but who have a, a very generalized knowledge, someone like me. So I, I tell people, I'm not the best coder there is. On the other hand, what I can do is I have enough knowledge of a lot of different things that I can connect the technical with the non-technical. So I'm very good at knowing, hearing what is needed in a project, what the final outcome is, but then knowing the steps of how to get there. And that actually is a very wanted skill. Someone who has all those soft skills and can connect the pieces together is really necessary. But if you're not one of those people, you name your field and you can get into it with statistics. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, now we're gonna move on to the student questions section and Miley and I are gonna pass it on to our fellow Women in Science eBoard members, Leah and Carly, um, to moderate this section. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Carly. Um, I'm a neuroscience major and then- Hi, I'm Leah, I'm a bio major. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna read the questions that people were asking in the room. So to start, um, I already went over to net. Uh, what are your biggest tips for networking? I know we kind of already talked about this, but I guess you have any top tips that wants to start? Um, I would say uh, for going to, for example, in well, in my field, uh, screenings, uh, award ceremonies, also uh, their seminars, and I it's for me, for example, that I'm 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 an introvert. It's 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 very hard sometimes. If you can find somebody in the field who goes with you, that always helps. Uh, like to to go and reach out to somebody. And also think about it. you're not the if you go alone, which I've been alone to like award ceremonies and it's so awkward. But um, there's also people that also went alone and are in the same like you. So kind of try to look for those people and say, oh hi, and like in an approach to them, people that are standing by themselves, and because you're not the only one who's like alone in that feeling that you're scared to start networking with somebody. I will agree with Rebecca. I'm an introvert. Um, so I know I have to network. And what I realize is I'm much better on one-to-one -one than I am in a large group. So I usually try to find one person that I would talk to for a while. And then that person might introduce me to another person and then I'll just focus on them. But I, I have to admit, when I do go to networking, oh, I am exhausted afterwards. I think I would just add to what the other panelists have said, because I totally agree that um, at professional events and conferences and even things like this, when somebody says, 
hey, like I just gave this presentation and there's my contact information on the slide, like reach out if you have any other questions, like take down that contact information and send that email. Like you can, you immediately have an introduction to be like, I saw your talk at blah, blah, blah. And you should, and like, I have this follow-up question or I'm interested in the field. Like they've put themselves out there as the presenter. And so they're probably more receptive to some of those kind of cold call type emails than uh, if you just kind of Googled random experts in the field. And uh, as someone else already commented, like most of us who work in a field, if we put on a presentation, it's because we like the field and we think it's a cool thing and we're excited about it and want to talk about it. Um, so the fact that you've reached out is a great way to like continue a conversation. I agree with uh, everything that everyone said. I have like only one conference under my wing and some networking events, but um, I guess you just have to remember all these people are people too, and don't be intimidated. Um, so this is a question specifically for Bella. Um, how do you prepare for the coding exams and how early in the year did you start looking for internships and did you get references? Um, so... So how early in the year? I started around October of my junior year. Wait, no. Yes, I think that's right. October of my junior year. Um, and I went and I applied for a few months because early postings happen in like October. Some jobs are rolling out the postings really early and some end their postings in March. But I'd say that I heard back on my internship towards the end of March and I applied from like October and went through the whole process and probably ended in February. I really think that earlier is better. So junior year, I also, for some reason, I don't know. I think that the junior year getting an internship was the best choice I could have made for myself. Um, and then coding exams, um, so I only got two references. I got one reference from Kendall's brother for Amazon. <laughs> and then I got a reference from, so Professor Oring reached out to me and was like, there's this alumni that is looking for employees at Google. Here's a reference. And I did get pretty far in the process, I think because of my abilities, but also I made it past that computer. And there's a lot of other applicants. Um, and then the, so lastly, the exams. So there's like three coding questions. There's this website called Hacker Rank, like Hacker Rank. I didn't practice enough. I I don't know. It was hard to balance like clubs and school and and applying along with playing field hockey and being so tired all the time. But um, let me think. Hacker Rank is so there's like certain alg algorithms that you have to kind of know how to code like quick sort and stuff like that i don't work with that really anymore because i don't know sorry i'm getting like jumbled in my brain so right now i work in platform engineering and that is like so the tech industry is ever changing and there's a bell curve like what's happening what's late tech what's um, ahead of the tech and whatever platform engineering is kind of distanced from front end back end but with all of these um, exams, you get three questions and you have to solve like these problems. It's like kind of logic, but if you know these algorithms, then you can solve them very well. So I think just really going through hacker rank at Java and Python, you can pick your language too. So I got two to three questions in these exams. I had about two hours to do it. And then you pick your language, Java or Python, or maybe I don't know, just like these industry standard languages. And then with the Google interview, I got a phone, two different phone calls with those types of questions, but I had to say it on the phone and they're from two different callers. Um, but yeah, if that made sense. And, and then from there, they'll determine, they'll score your, um, your exam 
and you'll move on. I recommend that if you're trying to do all three and trying to disperse your time in all three and you're kind of flopping and it's really difficult, pick one that you know you're going to ace or you'll know you'll do best, really grind that problem through and then move on to the next. If you're like, if you're like halfway through your time and you're trying to figure all three out at once. Um. Okay, thank you, Bella. Um, so this next question, I really like this question. Um, how do you maintain a good work-life balance? I feel like a lot of us want to know more about that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's a really good question. And it's very hard, especially in industries that have uh, very, sometimes very tight, tight deadlines or there are like, yeah, there are a, a seasons where are very busy, but I would try to, I'm very like scheduled. So even, sometimes, yeah, I have to work extra hours. And of course, like I, um, I don't have, for example, for me, I love exercising and sometimes I don't have to time to exercise, but, um, I think it's overall try to, it, I think it, with any job, there's going to be periods where you have to be prepared to to maybe sacrifice some parts of your personal life and like your routine, like it, but it's very important to still try as possible to take care of yourself, even though you don't have time to, I don't know, to go and eat with a friend and all that stuff to still take care of yourself. That's very important. Um, but in the other times that like are not as busy, try to have a schedule, like you usually work from, for example, I work from nine to, to six, um, I know that I have a, a schedule after work where, that I try to maintain the same and yeah, try to be structured in that way. I'm very structured. So for me, it's easy, not for everybody, but uh, I would say that's a good way to keep like balance, work life and personal life. I would say one, know yourself in terms of each one of us, there's something that's extremely important that helps us keep more, keep centered. For me, I know one, I must sleep. Like I, I have to get my sleep. And the second thing is I have to eat properly. If, and those two are like my highest priority. And I know getting a work-life balance was extremely difficult with my first career. I just, I, I just worked seven days a week. I worked about 60 or so hours a week for a long time and, and it was hard, but I just knew that if I didn't have those two things, I, I was just gonna fall through the cracks. So, and, and you have to have people, friends and family that are patient with you. <laughs> and help you along, support you along the way. Yeah, I think it was Kathy, when you were talking about showing up at places and like feeling if you fit, I think I would say like, don't discount, like understanding the mission and the ethos of organizations that you apply to uh, for two reasons. One, speaking to it in an interview or cover letter or even like kind of in how you tailor what you highlight in your resume is something that could really help you get past a, a screener or an initial interview because they'll be like, oh, they really believe in what we're doing here. Like equity, diversity, inclusion is really important to them. And I can see that because they've highlighted that they did this volunteer gig on their resume or um, because they pointed out whatever. So just as far as like getting a job, that's really important. But it's also really important in terms of work-life balance. Um, so if you join a company, and I had an interview where this happened, where someone was like, everybody works extra hours outside of their normal schedule. And like, they kind of pointed it out as like an expectation, even though uh, I was applying for like a pretty entry-level 40-hour week type job. And so, you know, if that's something that you don't want, you don't want to work all those extra hours, like that could be a flag in an interview where you go, I'm not going to keep moving forward with this uh, job opportunity, even though it might be something that I'm interested in, like you have to make that call for yourself. I would also say 
that uh, oftentimes in life, things seem super like urgent and important. And when you're able to take a step back and be like, no, that will be on my desk tomorrow. And uh, working in healthcare, sometimes there are things that it's like, it's life or death, whether or not someone on my team is able to make a phone call. But most of the time, even if it's somebody's like cancer or heart failure or whatever, the phone call can actually wait till tomorrow. So um, realizing where you can put a pause and say, it's 6 p.m. I'm done for the day. I'm not going to do my best work at this point. Go home, eat, get the food, and then come back in and make that call first thing in the morning. Um, it's a skill you have to learn, and I was really bad at it <laughs> for a really long time. Um, but just kind of, again, the self-advocacy and knowing who you are and what you want. I think you guys hit it all. Setting boundaries is important and like having conversations even with just your coworkers, like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Like I started coaching field hockey, like these little kids. And sometimes I had to drop off. I would normally work from nine to six because I have 40 hour weeks. But if I'd work nine to six, I get that half the day off on Friday. I'm very blessed. But um, I was like, hey, I have to coach on like Thursday nights. So I'm going to drop off at this time. And they're like, okay, that's fine. I'm dropping off at five on Thursdays and they're like that's fine so if there are things that you really want to do and you're in a job where the vibes are good then it shouldn't be a problem awesome thank you um so what is your biggest piece of advice for women in STEM I have some because I've been in a lot of situations where a man will discredit me or try and push me down or be literally so rude for no reason because of some internalized like misogyny and also recently I got invited to a caps game in a suite with one of the people that we work with this company data dog and I went and I showed up and I was the youngest by maybe six years and the only woman and there was like about like 17 people in there and I don't know just confidence is so important because people perceive that energy and I just held my like I like holding myself and standing my ground and not trying to I don't know it's hard to speak it but I just think confidence is so important and you can't let people perceive you as less than them Obviously, they're going to look at you in certain ways, but if you are very confident and you just, and you like believe in your work and you believe in yourself and you believe in your ideas and you believe in your knowledge, like that's the most important thing for a woman in STEM. Um, I know that we say our field is like male domi dominant and sometimes with like the, um, equity and inclusion push you don't see that necessarily around you and at American University there are a lot of women but then you go out to the real world sometimes and you see some things and you're like okay it still is very male dominant and um, that can be intimidating but do not let that get to you yeah I would agree with Bella like showing a lot of con like confidence in that you know what you're doing uh, thankfully, like within my peers, like it's very rare that some like diminishing of her being a woman or so, but it happens a lot. For example, with me, it happens a lot with actors, uh, with like specifically like male actors who are like 40 or above or 30 or above, who like if I do a comment, will won't take it the same as if uh, um, another male, another male sound engineer would have the same comment so you have to make sure you convey like you are like you're saying that because you know what you're talking about and it's because it's gonna benefit whatever job you're doing so be, yeah I agree with Bella like showing confidence and and it's very hard actually to it's it's a, a hard skill to to learn I agree with both of you it's a very difficult skill to learn. One of the techniques that I started doing because I have had, uh, I have worked with other women, which is 
many times if a woman suggests things, it's not heard. And then a male says the same thing and it's reinforced. So if you have a female that you are working with, partner with her, specifically when going into meetings. And if you have an idea or she has an idea, as soon as she or you say it, the other person chimes in and says, that was a really good suggestion and make sure it's re-emphasized and therefore it is the credit is given to you or given to her. It's, it's very important for women to stand together and to help each other. And the networking, the support system is extremely important to work with. I'm writing that down. That was like really good advice The having like a buddy to um, echo you. Sometimes I, I think I'm very confident, but sometimes like I think I also will say something too quiet because I am nervous for some reason. So I'm writing that down. A really good thing, and I have to say this, in statistics, there the association, there is the Caucus for Women in Statistics, the Committee for for women in statistics. And they have panels that literally talk about in jobs, what are the things that women can do to help women? So, and it's just really important to have those connections. Yeah, I'll say I have not struggled as much with this, I think as some of the other panelists may have. Um, because healthcare and nonprofits tend to have more women, it tends to be uh, much more balanced. And the majority of my like bosses and things have been women. Um, so getting heard, uh, it has been a little bit easier. Uh, I will say the place that it showed up for me wasn't so much in being a woman, but in being young. Um, I worked in a hospice nonprofit where the majority of people in the room were like 50 or 60 years old um, or older and uh, running like they were the executive board of the nonprofit and super uh, experienced professionals who had, you know, 20 years of experience and they had been the head of the like National Institute on whatever. And, you know, you walk into a room and you're like, why am I here? Like, am I qualified? And I think that circles back to the confidence that everyone has spoken to of if you're invited into the room like there's a reason and don't be afraid to speak up. Um, sometimes that totally different perspective um, or just skill set because you happen to be much better at technology than everybody else in the room uh, with your science background can really change a conversation or uh, help move a conversation forward. Okay, awesome. Thank you. That was great advice. Um, for one of our final questions, we have, is there anything that you wish you knew during your undergrad uh, to prepare you for your career and grad school? I wish I had known I'm so much better than I ever thought I was. I wish I'd known that it was okay to like stray from the path I had planned for myself and take the variety of opportunities presented. Yeah, um, I think I wish I had known that um, I could take more uh, than what I thought I could, like um, that I could actually, the more busy that I was, the more productive. I ended up being. So I learned that by actually getting out in the working world. Uh, I'm so fresh out of undergrad. I don't really have anything off the top of my head, but I do feel like on, on the other hand, I did overbook myself a lot and I don't know if that was necessary. I, yeah. <laughs> Those are great like pieces of advice. Um, we have another question. 
pretty specific to AU. Um, what, what was your favorite part about AU STEM pro science programs and also, I'm just going to add, just because I thought of it, but what was something from AU that you thought really helped, I guess, before you got into your career? In my case, I really like um, all of, um, like, from the CAS professors were very, always were willing to help, uh, open to office hours. I, like, spended hours in, in Professor Larkin's office um, and all of my professors and, and like, very glad that they were always willing to help with whatever it was and they were like a family away from home because I was so far from home and they were practically my family also and oh your second question I totally forgot uh eh, what, what what did you ask I'm sorry what was the other part of the question um just off the top of my head I was wondering what was something at AU specifically uh -huh that you thought really helped you launch into your career? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I thought um, at AU that you really like, I guess advocate for getting internships and they have a like, in, and I thought that was like super helpful because I guess I started taking internships uh, starting from my uh, sophomore year and I took like every semester and that truly helped me not only get like work experience, but also decide in which field I wanted to focus on it truly it, it like by having experience in different fields of audio it was that I said oh it, what makes sense for me is sound for film it's what I truly like I'll go but I kind of forgot the questions <laughs> um the question was which one was it, it it was what was your favorite part about AU science programs? And then Carly added a twist to it, like what was something that's AU specific that helped you um get into your career or just um to your grad program, whatever. Okay. Um, I'd say Professor Oring, if anyone who knows who that is, he was so great. And like, I don't know, all the professors I had really believed in me and wanted. Professor Oring like really cared for me and like really helped me like he wanted me to help be his TA he believed in me to help him like get the robotics club back up and just all these other things that I wouldn't have been a part of without him which was really cool and on top of that um well something that helped me launch into my career I guess was just all the different like I'm a completely different person than I was when I came into college. So just all the experiences that the computer science department brought me has made me a better person. And the design and build lab, if any of you guys have not been to the design and build lab, you need to go because it's like the coolest creative space and you could like make anything. And I think it applies to all parts of STEM. And the person who runs it, Gustavo, is super cool and like welcoming. And I got to do all these side projects where I, I don't know, there's like laser cutters. You have all the supplies you could ever imagine. So if you ever have any ideas or you want to go find a cool creative place to just study and do your homework, you should go to the design and build lab. Yeah. Um. I think my favorite part about the AU sciences, and I know they have grown a little bit since I was there, um, was just kind of the close-knit nature of the programs I was part of. So my like departments became my friend groups, and they also became uh, my study groups and people that I genuinely spent hours with and enjoyed the time. Um, I think something that AU kind of semi-uniquely helped me with was I did a research project, uh, worked in one of the labs on campus with Dr. Carlini, and um, I ended up being able to be like one of the lead authors on a publication, uh, well, the second author on a publication, and that has been something that I've been able to use professionally on a resume and really like kind of highlight that I can build deep expertise in an area in my field. Um, and it's something that I really, really appreciated and built a lot of skills by doing. 
for me, it was the fact, so I was in statistics and Mary Gray and Monica Jackson supported me and they mentored me. And this was the first time I had ever really been supported and mentored when I was a student. So it was, it really helped me a lot. And I'm quite grateful that they did that. Okay, and I think with our time, we're gonna wrap it up. And just wanna thank you panelists, um, just for very grateful time and all of your experience that you shared with us. And if you wouldn't mind taking um, a photo with our in-person audience, we're gonna just, organize in front of our big screen if that's okay with everyone. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, we're gonna do that real quick. <laughs>